So I did say the landowner. Kind of an interesting statement considering we're in the wilderness, but this wilderness but it is all divided into two halves. So the left side is primarily owned private is primarily owned by three ranchers, own a lot of that on the left hand side. But what they did was something very special, something to help preserve the canyon. They put that land into conservation and protected it. They marked it for historical agricultural put to do it the good old fashioned way, do use hand saws to complete that trail maintenance. We had a fire taking place high in the cliffs above Merriweather. Fire started by lightning in July and continued burning until the snow put it out in November. By the end of that fire, it had burned and consumed 46,000 acres of wilderness. It did not burn or touch the picnic area though. However, there's a very narrow canyon to get in here. But what did happen was in the springtime of 2008, well, that 12 feet of snow began to melt. That water rushing down through here in the springtime, carrying with it and carrying and creating what is known as a debris flow washing out through the picnic area and burying it in several feet of mud. So the Forest Service went in there, they, they did close it, and then they dug it all out. Now once Steam safe, they reopened it once again. Now that was kind of the last maintenance that was done. So 15 years later, last summer, an all-female, all-woman conservation corps went, went in there. There were two teams. They worked two weeks on, two weeks off. They laid in their 40 pallets of beauty bark, redid the pass. They painted and replaced walls, rotting walls in the pavilion, and replaced the retaining walls, all the picnic tables, and the barbecue grills. They gave it a much needed and much appreciated facelift. So the original tour that Nicholas Hill. find anything and everything with these canyon walls. So last summer I had two guys sitting up here next to me. We did this and we showed them the stony elephant. Well they kind of giggled and they're like, no, no, that's uh, that's job in the hut up there. And the other guys, no, 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 I see Batman. So I kind of quit driving and I pulled the motors back like this. Astonished and really taken back by those images, right? What are they, like, where do they see this? And I'm like, Asked them like, hey, by the way, did you guys happen to stop at the dispensary on your way down through here? <laughs> they were like, no, what do you mean? I'm like, because no one has ever actually ever seen that. And to this day, the only thing I can really ever see in that in that wall is going to be the elephant. And just for you guys, I sent that memo and it brought her out today. August 4th, 1949, there's a massive lightning storm that comes through this area and lights and sets off 13, 13 fires within the Canyon Ferry Fire District. One of them taking place right here at Man Goat. Now they want to get this fire put out. It is policy that states that every wildland forest fire must be put out by 10 o'clock in the morning. But we know that today is just not feasibly possible. But they have to get, they can't get conventional firefighters in there. There are no roads. So they will call the Smoke Jump Center in Missoula, Montana, and request two plane loads of jumpers. One of them already had been previously dispatched to West Yellowstone. So 16 men will load onto a C 47 named Miss Montana. They will depart Missoula in the afternoon of August 5th, heading to Mangult. Now, as they're flying over Mangult, the fire spotter sitting in the doorway. He finds the fire, it's in the back cliffs in the back side of Van Gogh, and it sits about the shape of an oval and just about 30 acres. To the right of him, Wag Dodge on the right, on the other side of the door. He formulates a plan. They're gonna leap out of the plane, land along the left-hand side, and keeping the cool waters of Missouri at their backs, they're gonna fight it, come up to it from the bottom side hill to get there. So 
Well, they're going over there. So now, as they're flying, 15 of those 16 men will sit in that doorway. They will feel the tap and they will leap out of that plane, scattering along the left-hand side. Now the last one, the 16th, he didn't actually jump. He got airsick, went back to Missoula and never jumped again. So they're doing this. They land along the left-hand side. Wang Dodge gathers them up, tells them to gather your gear and eat for it's going to be a long night. So they, they're looking out the fire and to their disbelief, Wag Dodge is looking in his binoculars and he sees that there's actually already someone up there fighting that fire. This man is known as James Harrison. So James Harrison, this summer of 49, is the Merriweather guard down there at Merriweather picnic area. And he saw the lightning strike. He went up to investigate, he saw the fire. He went back down 1,500 vertical feet, got his gear, leaving a note that says he'll be back by three o'clock the next afternoon. Went back up 1,500 vertical feet for that second time that day and started fighting the fire. So Egg Dodge leaves the group and goes to investigate. Immediately running into him and recognizing who it is. Because James Harrison wasn't always the Merriweather guard. He was, in fact, the summer before, a smoke jumper. Although his mother begged him to find a different job, one a lot less dangerous. So he quit the smoke jumpers and he became the picnic ground host. So they make it, they leave, and they walk back to the other side. Now something happens, something terrible happens. That wind switched directions and brought that fire down the mouth of the, down the side of the mountain crossing the middle and up the other side and it trapped them away from the Missouri River. That fire and that wind now moving at a hunt at uh, covering 100 feet of timber every 10 seconds. Wet Dodge knows they can't win, will give the command to drop your tools and run. They're now running up this left hand side. This side is a 60 degree angle. There are no trees to help you along the way and there's no cliffs to seek refuge until the very, very top. So they were running up there. Wag Dodge, though, he suffers from stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he runs until he can't run anymore. He will end up dropping and falling to his knees out of breath. That fire quickly approaching. For some unknown reason, he will pull his book of matches out and he will light that fire. Now this indication, this technique would be known as the rescue fire. So he does that, burns a good square area, calls to, uh, to his men to stay with him, but he thinks he hears curses. They are not going to stay and be with a guy who just lit a fire within another fire. That seems really crazy to them. So they continue running up that left-hand side. They're trying to outrun the fire. So Wang Dog's now all by himself. We'll pull his canteen out, wet his handkerchief, pull it over his face, pull his canvas hood over his head, and he just lays down, lays down in this burned out area for 10 minutes. That fire rages on, burning and blowing past him, doing 70 miles an hour and levitating him off the ground three times in the process. But 10 minutes goes by, rises out of the ashes if he's a phoenix, he's not burned, not, there's no blisters, he's not injured in any way. He then goes and looks for the boys, he called them, those other smoke jumpers. He will actually only find two of them that are still left standing. They made it to the top, but they put in their reports that this fire had licked their boot heels the entire way. So the 10 minutes Wang Dodge laid in that burned out area, that fire burned 3,000 acres of a 5,000 acre fire in 10 minutes alone. And from the time they landed on deck, to the time that fire had passed, taking the lives of all 13 of those smoke jumpers was just over an hour. It was a very, very fast time. Now, if you wanted to follow in the footsteps of those smoke jumpers, well, you would get dropped off right here at that sign for the Man Gulch fire. You would hike in there about a mile and a half to two miles. You will then notice a hillside scattered with crosses and markers. There'll be 13 of them, 12 with crosses and one with the Star of David. They will mark and note the location of each one of those fallen smoke jumpers. Now, I have hiked in there and I have hiked that pathway. Now, for, for those men to have gone from the top to the bottom and cleared the ridge line 
and survived that fire, they would have had to have cleared it in about two and a half minutes. It took me 30 minutes, and I thought I was going to have a heart attack in the process. There's a book, very good book written about this fire called Young Men in Fire. It is written by the author Norman McLean. Now, we are going to continue going down, down River Jump, and we will cut across. We will cut across from right to left. In doing so, keep in mind, pay attention to that cliff right there at Man Gulch. And you will start seeing the limestone cliffs further up across from Merriweather Picnic area. Left hand side, that cliff right there at Man Gulch. That's kind of cool with the boat coming through. Yeah. All right, those. Let's see here. Those limestone cliffs starting to come into view on the right hand side of the river. Wait for it. Just about right now, those rock walls separating, opening what would be known as the gates to the Rocky Mountains. So now I'm going to turn the boat back around and come back across the river and close them for the right hand side. Just about now, those gates are now closed. We are stuck below the rock and out of the Rocky Mountains. Stuck down here. Gates are now closed in my mind. If this had a theme song or a sound, it would sound a lot like the uh, theme song to Law and Order where those cell doors shut. So now we sit down here. We currently sit in about 45 feet more water than they had. 40 feet more water. We're sitting about 55 feet of water through this area. Now Lewis and Clark, they would have rounded that bend right up there. They would have continued paddling up here. They would have saw these gates just as you guys did, appeared to be closed. But now as they would have continued paddling, they would have slowly have started to open. This is where Meriwether Lewis annotated in his leather-bound journals that this was the gates of the Rocky Mountains. So the osprey catches a fish probably 60 to 70 percent of the time, catching one most pretty much a good percentage. Eagle though, they're a scavenger. They only catch a fish probably about every 30. 